Chapter 11. John Cage. John Cage is the most important and influential composer of our time. At least that's what author Kyle Gann attempted to write in his New York Times obituary for Cage, until he was informed by his editors that he could not refer to Cage as a composer, but rather as a music philosopher. Apparently the New York Times had no problem with Gann's assessment of Cage's importance or influence, but only with his vocation as a composer. Similarly, Arnold Schoenberg was once asked if he had any interesting American students. He replied that there were none, but then he smiled and said, There was one, John Cage. Schoenberg quickly added, Of course he is not a composer, but he's an inventor of genius. This reluctance to acknowledge John Cage as a composer only serves to illustrate the point that his iconoclastic ideas have redefined the very notion of what it means to be a composer, thereby demonstrating his immense influence and importance. John Cage was born in Los Angeles in 1912, the son of an inventor who built one of the first functioning submarines. Cage began playing the piano as a child, but considered himself a poor student because he was uninterested in practising scales. While in college, he became convinced that he would be a writer. He then persuaded his parents that going to Europe would be more useful to him than continuing in college. So, in his third year in college, he dropped out and went to Paris. In Paris, Cage came into contact with a wide variety of modern painting and music, and became convinced that, if others were doing this, he could do it as well. Back in Los Angeles, he accordingly began to paint and write music. According to Cage, those who heard his music had better things to say than those who saw his paintings, so he decided to devote himself to music. In the 1930s, Arnold Schoenberg and Igor Stravinsky were both living in Los Angeles. For young musicians like Cage, these two world-renowned composers represented opposite musical philosophies, Schoenberg representing modernism and Stravinsky representing neoclassicism. In 1933, Cage chose Schoenberg and modernism. Cage relates the story. I went to see Schoenberg in Los Angeles. He said, you probably couldn't afford my price. I said, you don't need to mention it because I don't have any money. So he said, will you devote your life to music? And I said that I would. Cage studied with Schoenberg for two years. Finally, it became evident that he and Schoenberg had a fundamental difference on the subject of harmony. Several times I tried to explain to Schoenberg that I had no feeling for harmony. He told me that without a feeling for harmony I would always encounter an obstacle, a wall through which I would not be able to pass. My reply was that in that case I would devote my life to beating my head against that wall. Maybe that's what I've been doing ever since. Because Cage had an aversion to harmony, he initially considered himself to be exclusively a composer of music for percussion instruments. In 1938, he was asked to write music for a dancer named Savilla Fort for a performance at the Cornish School in Seattle. The performance space was small, and there was no room for Cage's percussion instruments. The only available instrument was an upright piano, which was built into the seating area. Cage hit upon the idea of inserting foreign objects between the strings of the piano, thereby changing its sound from a harmonic sound to a percussive sound. In effect, this prepared piano became a one-man percussion ensemble. Bonnie Bird, a modern dance instructor at the Cornish School, remembers the invention of the prepared piano vividly. Cage was at this time her accompanist. I had a couple of students who were just completing their fourth year, she said. One of them was an absolutely beautiful black girl named Sevilla Fort. When Sevilla and I were discussing her graduation concert, I said she could have two or three pieces written for her by different composers available from the music department, and John was one of them. John came to me after the dance and said, I have to have a gamelan orchestra. I laughed at him and said, John, you're absolutely crazy, we can't even afford 50 cents. John played for the class on a beat-up grand piano. The dance studios tended to get the leftovers from the music students. It wasn't in the greatest condition. I had a little box behind the piano where I kept all the nuts and bolts and things that fell off. One of the dances which Bird students were practising had a script which called for telegrams to flutter to the stage. Bonnie Bird had the idea that, instead of telegrams, the dancers would flutter to the stage, sliding on a fireman's pole. She visited the local fire department to see about getting a pole, but was informed that the actual pole, which was solid brass, was quite expensive. Nevertheless, she visited the brass foundry to investigate, and was given a little piece of pole for her trouble. She said, I handed this piece of brass to John at the beginning of a technique class, and I said, Well, you can't have a gamelan, I can't have a brass pole. The upshot of this was that John took the piece of metal and put it into the tray of the piano. 
The tray was a bit wobbly, and when John started to play the first chords for the warm-up exercise, it fell off and rolled up the strings as he was playing. Of course, it made an extraordinary sound, and John, from that moment on, was gone as far as the class was concerned. He began ignoring us, playing different things and experimenting with this metal rolling on the strings. Then he got tired of that and began inserting things from the box full of nuts and bolts into the strings and getting different qualities. By the end of the class, he said, I have a solution to the problem of the gamelan. In 1935, Cage married an artist named Xenia Kashavarov, but their marriage began to unravel in the 1940s and eventually ended in divorce in 1945. In the aftermath of the breakup, Cage's personal sense of identity and emotional life were thrown into turmoil. At the same time, he began to experience a professional identity crisis as well. Like most musicians, Cage had been taught and assumed that the purpose of music was communication, to express feelings and ideas. However, he observed that in the 20th century, all the composers were speaking a different musical language, and therefore no communication was taking place. Cage himself had experienced the frustration of miscommunication. I noticed, he said, that when I consciously wrote something sad, people and critics were often apt to laugh. In 1944, Cage had written a piece for prepared piano entitled The Perilous Night, which, for him, was filled with feelings of grief and fear, but was dismissed by a critic as sounding like a woodpecker in a church belfry. I had poured a great deal of emotion into the piece, Cage wrote, and obviously was not communicating this at all. I determined to give up composition unless I could find a better reason for doing it than communication. In 1946, Cage enrolled in a class in Zen Buddhism taught by D.T. Suzuki, a noted author and expert on the subject, and began a lifelong embrace of Eastern philosophy which informed and inspired his work from that time forward. I was in such serious necessity that I was on the edge of being unable to function, Cage said. Though I do not want to blame Zen Buddhism for what I have done, I would not have done what I have done except for it. About this time, Cage met a musician from India named Gita Sarabhai. Before she returned to India, Cage said, I learned from her the traditional reason for making a piece of music in India, to quiet the mind, thus making it susceptible to divine influence. Since he had already found that, for him, communication was an inadequate reason for creating music, Cage adopted this rationale as a substitute. The question then became, what is a quiet mind, and what are divine influences? Cage decided that a sober and quiet mind is one in which the ego does not obstruct the fluency of things that come into our senses. Our business in living is to become fluent with the life we are living, and art can help with this. In his book, Silence, Cage later refined and restated his philosophy. Our intention is to affirm this life, not to bring order out of chaos, nor to suggest improvements in creation, but simply to wake up to the very life we're living, which is so excellent once one gets one's mind and desires out of its way and lets it act of its own accord. Cage now came to believe that the purpose of music was not communication between the artist and the audience, rather the purpose of music was to allow sounds to be themselves and, in their being themselves, to open the minds of the people who made them or listened to them to other possibilities that they had previously considered, to widen their experience particularly in the making of value judgments. A value judgment does not exist except within the mind, Cage asserts. When the mind says this is good and that is not good, it's a decision to eliminate from experience certain things. Suzuki said Zen wants us to diminish that kind of activity of the ego and to increase the activity that accepts the rest of creation. Cage's understanding of Zen Buddhism led him to a radical new definition of music as simply a collection of sounds. He conceived of the whole range of sounds, including traditional musical sounds, noise-type sounds, and even the absence of sound, as equally usable in music. To accommodate this new world of sounds, Cage developed a conception of musical form as an empty container into which any sound might be placed. In early 1951, one of Cage's students, Christian Wolf, presented him with a copy of the I Ching, an ancient Chinese text used for divination. Through a table of 64 hexagrams, questions may be posed to the I Ching, to which answers are obtained by means of chance operations, such as tossing coins. Cage immediately saw that the chance procedures of the I Ching's divination table could be used for making complex musical decisions, thereby removing the will and taste of the composer entirely from the compositional decision-making process. 
Cage believed that he had discovered a way to realise his ideal of a sober and quiet mind in which the ego does not obstruct the fluency of things that come into the senses. For Cage, as a composer, his job would no longer be the making of musical decisions, but instead the asking of musical questions, for which the I Ching would furnish the answers. I try to ask radical questions, he said, questions that get at the root of things. If I succeed, then the answers, even though they come through chance operations, will be, I believe, revelatory in the sense of revealing to me more of creation than staying with my mind the way it was. The I Ching is also known as the Book of Changes. For this reason, Cage chose the title Music of Changes for his first composition written through consultation with the I Ching. Cage drew several large charts, each concerned with some parameter of music, pitch, duration, dynamic level, tempo, and density, number of simultaneous sounds. The charts were made up of cells, each of which contained some musical element. To plot a single note, he tossed three coins six times, to correspond to the hexagrams in the I Ching. The result would direct him to a number in the I Ching, which in turn would correspond to a numbered position on his chart. The entire procedure would be repeated over and over again to determine the note's duration, dynamic level and all other parameters. Silences are obtained through a separate sounds chart. Another chart was used to determine density, how many sound events would occur simultaneously. Another chart was used to determine structural changes, such as the moving of cells within the charts. The results were carefully transcribed and notated on a traditional musical staff. By this complex and painstaking method, Music of Changes was created. While living in New York, Cage became close to the Abstract Expressionist, even joining their artist club which congregated on 8th Street in Lower Manhattan. Cage gave several lectures to the group, and they proved to be a receptive audience for his ideas and his music. But it was two younger artists, Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg, not part of the Abstract Expressionist circle, that came directly into Cage's orbit. During the summer of 1951, Rauschenberg had been working on a series of monochrome paintings known as the White Paintings, several panels consisting of nothing but ordinary house paint, uniformly applied to the canvas with a roller. These paintings by Rauschenberg had a tremendous impact on Cage. He wrote later that it was these White Paintings that gave him the courage to create what has since become Cage's most famous, or infamous, work, 433. According to Cage, he had been considering a project like 433 for several years, but had abandoned it for fear of being dismissed as a cynical prankster. I was afraid, he said, that making a piece that had no sounds would appear as if I were making a joke. The title 433 refers to the duration of the work, 4 minutes 33 seconds, during which the performer does nothing. It was first performed at the Maverick Concert Hall in Woodstock, New York, on August 29, 1952, by Cage's friend, the virtuoso pianist David Tudor. In the audience that night were fellow composers Morton Feldman and Earl Brown, whose works were also on the programme. Also present were vacationing members of the New York Philharmonic, curious about the activities of the musical avant-garde. Apart from turning the pages of the music, Tudor merely sat at the piano, not touching the instrument at all. Recalling this first performance, Cage said, People began whispering to one another, and some people began to walk out. They didn't laugh, they were irritated when they realised nothing was going to happen, and they haven't forgotten it thirty years later, they're still angry. Cage speculated on the reason for the hostility of the first audience. They missed the point. There's no such thing as silence. What they thought was silence, because they didn't know how to listen, was full of accidental sounds. You could hear the wind stirring outside during the first movement. During the second, raindrops began pattering on the roof, and during the third, the people themselves made all kinds of interesting sounds as they talked or walked out. In the conversation after the concert, it became evident that the anger of the audience had not dissipated. David Tudor recalls that a local artist stood up and said, Good people of Woodstock, let's drive these people out of town. What no one in the audience that night could have known was that they had just witnessed a significant historical event, the premiere of what came to be considered by many the pivotal composition of this century.